In the last few videos, we learned about cyclic codes, which involve taking message polynomials and multiplying them by a special generator polynomial g of x to get valid codeword polynomials. In this example, the message polynomials live in a three-dimensional space since they have a maximum degree of two. And after multiplication by the generator, the codeword polynomials live in a six-dimensional space since their maximum degree is 5. Now we're going to learn about Reed-Solomon codes. Reed-Solomon codes are cyclic polynomial codes that use a generator polynomial g of x just like we've seen before. The thing that's special about Reed-Solomon codes is that, given a message of length k and a code word length n, Reed-Solomon codes correct the maximum number of errors that's theoretically possible by providing the largest theoretically possible minimum distance d between the code words. Because of this, we say that Reed-Solomon codes are maximum distance separable, or MDS, a property that I'll talk about later. The first thing to know about Reed-Solomon codes is that they include non-binary codes. Up until this point, we've only been looking at binary codes, where the code words are made up of zeros and ones. In non-binary codes, the code words are made up of symbols, which I've written here using Greek letters such as alpha, beta, and gamma. That being said, in real life, all code words need to be processed by a computer of some kind, and computers only deal with zeros and ones. So actually, these symbols in non-binary codes are actually zeros and ones grouped together. But here's the key point. Non-binary codes do not correct individual zeros and ones that contain errors. Instead, non-binary codes will correct an entire symbol at once. Let's take a look at how this impacts error correction. Let's say that we're using the standard binary codes that we've seen before. We have some binary code words, and the errors are underlined and highlighted in red. This code word has only one error bit inside, so we can probably fix it. But this code word has seven error bits inside, and this is too many errors for us to fix. So these errors can't be corrected with these binary code words. Now, in the world of non-binary code words, we would treat all of these bits as a sequence of four symbols, alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. A symbol is considered to be an error if any of its interior bits has an error. So here, the symbols alpha and delta are fine, but the symbols beta and gamma are errors. But if these two error symbols, beta and gamma, are just two symbols in a larger code word made of symbols, it is possible that we could correct the errors, since only a couple of the symbols in the code word went wrong. So the advantage of using symbols instead of binary bits is that symbols can let us correct a wider variety of errors. In particular, when several bits in a row contain errors, this is called a burst error. Burst errors can be difficult to correct, since burst errors can completely mess up an entire code word leaving it useless. But with non-binary codes, since several bits belong to only one symbol in the code word, several bits in a row can contain errors, and this will only affect a small number of symbols in the code word, which means the error can be easily fixed. The symbols in non-binary code words are members of special sets called finite fields. In this video, we're going to discuss finite fields with orders that are prime, and in the next video, we'll discuss finite fields with orders that are prime powers. So, when learning about binary codes, we made messages and code words out of polynomials from the integers mod 2 adjoin x. Remember, this means polynomials in the x variable with coefficients from the integers mod 2 so the coefficients would just be zeros and ones. For non-binary codes, we're going to study Q-ary codes. These are polynomials in the x variable with coefficients from the finite field of order Q. When I say a field has order Q, I just mean that the field has Q members.
So a field of order 7 has 7 members. So you might be asking, what's a field? When I say a field, this has nothing to do with vector fields or scalar fields that you might see in a physics class. Instead, I mean an algebraic field, which is a definition that comes from abstract algebra. Roughly speaking, a field is a bunch of stuff where the operations of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division make sense. There's a more technical and formal definition of a field, which lists properties like associativity and commutativity, but I'm not going to get into these details. You can check the description for links to this formal definition if you want. For our purposes, a collection of stuff is a field if we can add, subtract, multiply, and divide the stuff. The real numbers, complex numbers, and rational numbers are all examples of fields. These fields are called infinite fields because they each contain an infinite number of members. The integers, however, are not a field. This is because, even though addition, subtraction, and multiplication are easily done with integers, division does not always work for integers. For example, it's true that 6 divided by 3 works out nicely to the integer 2. But 4 divided by 3 doesn't work out to be an integer. Division between two integers cannot be defined in a way that always gives us another integer. This means that the integers are not a field, because division isn't well defined for them. Now, I said that non-binary codes are defined using finite fields. A finite field is just a set where addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division make sense, and the set has a finite number of elements. So the real, complex, and rational numbers are infinite fields because they have an infinite number of members. Examples of finite fields include the integers mod 2, the integers mod 3, and the integers mod 5. It turns out that we can define division properly in these sets. Earlier, I said that 4 divided by 3 in the ordinary integers doesn't work out properly to be an integer. But in the integers mod 5, 4 divided by 3 does have a sensible answer that lives in the integers mod 5. The key to doing this division is understanding the idea of a multiplicative inverse. The multiplicative inverse of a number x is denoted x with a minus 1 exponent, and when we multiply x by its inverse we get the number 1. For example, in the real numbers, the multiplicative inverse of 7 is 1 seventh, because 7 times 1 seventh equals 1. Multiplicative inverses help us do division because division is really just multiplication in disguise. For example, in the real numbers, 22 divided by 7 is really just 22 multiplied by the inverse of 7, so 22 times 1 seventh. If we go back to the integers mod 5 and look at 4 divided by 3, this is the same thing as 4 times the multiplicative inverse of 3. The inverse of 3 in the integers mod 5 is just the number 2, since 3 times 2 equals 6, which taken mod 5 is just 1. So 4 divided by 3 is really 4 times 3's inverse, which is 4 times 2, which is 8, or 3 if we take it mod 5. So 4 divided by 3 does make sense in the integers mod 5, even though it doesn't make sense in the ordinary integers. For the integers mod 2, 3, 5, and 7, all non-zero members of these sets have multiplicative inverses. So we can define how to do division between any two non-zero numbers. This means these are all finite fields. The integers mod 4, 6, and 8 are not finite fields, because not all members have multiplicative inverses. You might be wondering why some of these sets don't always have multiplicative inverses. Well, the trick is that if we do the integers mod a prime number, then all non-zero numbers are guaranteed to have a multiplicative inverse. 2, 3, 5, and 7 are all prime numbers, so these sets are finite fields. 
So why do the integers mod a prime number always give us a finite field? We'll see why using an example. Let's take the integers mod 7, whose members are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now let's multiply all of these numbers by 5. So 0 times 5 is 0, 1 times 5 is 5, 2 times 5 is 10, which is 3 when working mod 7, 3 times 5 is 15, which is 1 when working mod 7, and so on. We see that we get the seven same numbers again as results, just shuffled around in a different order. Most importantly, we see that when we multiply 3 times 5, we get 1. This means that the multiplicative inverse of 5 is the number 3. Let's try the same thing for the integers mod 8, whose members are the integers 0 through 7. Let's again multiply each of these numbers by 5 and we see that we get the same eight numbers just shuffled around in a different order. Again, most importantly, we see that five times five equals one. So the multiplicative inverse of five is five. So five is its own multiplicative inverse in the integers mod eight. Now let's do this exercise again, except multiplying the sets by the number two. With the integers mod seven, multiplying by two just shuffles the numbers around and we see that four times two equals one. So the multiplicative inverse of two in the integers mod seven is four. Now with the integers mod eight, when we multiply by two, something interesting happens. We don't get the entire number set shuffled around. Instead, we get zero, two, four, six, zero, two, four, six. We get a subset of the original numbers with repetitions. And most importantly, none of the results are equal to one. This means that there is no number that multiplies two to give one. So two has no multiplicative inverse in the integers mod eight, which is why the integers mod eight don't form a field. With the integers mod seven, all non-zero numbers have multiplicative inverses. But with the integers mod eight, some numbers have multiplicative inverses and others do not. This is why the integers mod 7 are a field, and the integers mod 8 are not a field. To finish off this video, I'll prove that the integers mod a prime number p will have multiplicative inverses for every non-zero member, and the proof is done by contradiction. Let's take the integers mod p, where p is a prime number. So the members are the integers 0 through p minus 1. Then we'll multiply all these numbers by some non-zero multiplier m that's from the integers mod p. So m is an integer between 0 and p. If m has an inverse, the number 1 should appear as one of the results. But let's assume that m does not have an inverse. This means that the number 1 will not appear as one of the results which means that the results must contain at least some repetition of the same number. Let's say that i and j are two members of the integers mod p that get mapped to the same result when multiplied by the multiplier m. And we'll say that i is the larger of the two numbers, so i is greater than j. This means that m times i and m times j give the same result, so they are equivalent mod p. This means that m times i and m times j are separated by some multiple of p, which we'll call p times n. So if both i and j get mapped to the same number, then we have the equation m times i minus j equals p times n. Since m is between 0 and p, and i minus j is also between 0 and p, it's impossible for m times i minus j to be a multiple of p if p is a prime number. This would be like trying to multiply two integers less than 7 and getting a multiple of 7 as a result. We simply can't do it. We can't get a multiple of 7 unless 7 is already in our multiplication, since 7 is a prime number. The only possible conclusion is that both sides are equal to 0, 
which means that we have i equals j. This means that if two numbers map to the same result after being multiplied by m, they're actually the same number. This means that there are no repetitions in the results after multiplication by m, which means the number 1 must be present in the results somewhere. This guarantees that m has a multiplicative inverse. Since m is any non-zero member of the integers mod p, this means that all non-zero members of the integers mod a prime have multiplicative inverses. So the integers mod a prime will always form a field. Now if p wasn't prime, say it was the number 8, we could find a way of satisfying this equation that doesn't result in 0. In this example, 2 times 5 and 2 times 1 are separated by a multiple of 8. This means that 2 times 5 and 2 times 1 give the same repeated result in the integers mod 8. So the number 2 has no inverse in the integers mod 8 since it leads to repetition in the results when we multiply the set by 2. So the integers mod p, where p is not a prime number, do not form a field, because some elements don't have multiplicative inverses. In the next video, we'll see how we can also construct fields from a number of members that's a prime power. So there are fields with 5 to the 2 members and 7 to the 3 members, because these are powers of prime numbers 7 and 5.